Assalamu alaikum, welcome to Questions on British Muslim TV with me, Mohammed Shafiq. We're broadcasting on Sky Channel 752 and across social media at British Muslim TV. Wherever you are joining us, a very warm welcome. Um, we want to hear your thoughts and experiences on the stories we're featuring. Call us now on 019242310083 or on the WhatsApp number which is on your screen now. Let's give you the latest uh, news. The US Secretary of State Antony Blinken has been in the Middle East. He was in Cairo today following the ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. Secretary Blinken has said the United States will provide $75 million, which is £52 million, in assistance for the Palestinians. He has said the US would also reopen his consulate in Jerusalem to better the relationship between the United States and the Palestinian leadership. During the 11-day military campaign, Israel bombing led to 252 Palestinians who were killed, of which 65 were children. 1,900 have been injured, and in Israel, which was subject to over 3,500 rockets by Hamas and other military groups from Gaza, led to 12 dead, including two children. The humanitarian crisis has been well documented, with over 130 trucks of medical aid, food and petrol reaching Gaza from the Rafah crossing. And the Egyptian president, uh, President al-Sisi, promising 500 m million dollars in aid for the Palestinians in Gaza. Now, it's the children in Gaza who have been bearing the brunt of the military strikes. With 65 dead and many injured, it will take a long time for those that survive to deal with the mental health and trauma that they are currently suffering from. Now, in other news, an inquiry has criticised the Conservative Party for failing to properly investigate allegations of internal racism because of a lack of transparency, training and staff. The report was ordered into Islamophobia and was led by Professor Swaran Singh and was completed in March but only released yesterday. In some of those findings, the Conservatives recorded 1,418 complaints concerning 727 incidents of alleged discrimination between 2015 and 2020. Two-thirds of the incidents related to allegations of anti-Muslim discrimination. The people interviewed by the investigation who experienced discrimination did so at the level of a local party association. Now, local anti-Muslim sentiments was demonstrated by a number of social media complaints against party members which were upheld. The co-chair of the Conservative Party, Amanda Millian, has welcomed the report and said the party accepts all the recommendations. But Baroness Saeed Warsi, the former chair of the Conservative Party, has said that there were issues from the top to the bottom of the party. Saj Karim, who's the former MEP for the North West, has said the report had failed to identify endemic party prejudice aimed at Muslims. I'm sure we'll come back to the story in the coming weeks to reflect on the report and lessons learned. Now, in other news, Downing Street has said they will be updating the guidance for areas where the Indian COVID-19 variant is spreading to make it clearer that they're not imposing local restrictions out of lockdown. This follows confusion over the government advice for people in the hotspots of the Indian variant not to travel in and out of these locations. Opposition MPs have criticised the confusion. Shortly, we head to Cairo to talk to Osama Din Alim, uh, who is a senior scholar and lecturer at the Al-Azhar University, about interfaith in the world and how the Abrahamic faiths can come together after what's happened these past two weeks. Hussam joins us live shortly from Cairo. Then we head to Blackburn to give you the Labour Party response to the local election results including that sensational victory of Tiger Patel, who was my guest last week. We'll be talking to senior Labour councillor Shoka Hussain, who will be joining us live from Blackburn. And then we finish off in Paris, in France, to discuss Macron's war on Islam, as some Muslim leaders claim, with political columnist Hamid Khrit. Uh, he'll be joining us uh, around uh, 9.30. So we want to hear from you tonight. You can call us on 01924 or messages on British Muslim TV across social media. Send us a WhatsApp message. The number is on your screen. Sorry, uh, my auto cues uh, moved. Um, is this the beginning of the end of the Labour Party? How can the Abrahamic faiths come together? And how can we tackle the division that we are seeing in the, in the world today? And is President Macron's rightward drift an attack on Islam and Muslims? Please share your thoughts on 01924-231-0830 or you can message us on WhatsApp. The number is on your screen. Now, let's start with our first guest. The events in Gaza and Israel have, uh, have led to hundreds being killed in 
who, including children. We've seen claim and counterclaim from both sides and sadly a rise in anti-Semitism and Islamophobia around the world. Now, how can Jews, Muslims and Christians, as people of the Abrahamic faiths, come together? Is there a real way forward? Hussam Adin Alim is a scholar and imam at the Al-Azhar University in Cairo. He's recently been selected by the United Nations Alliance of Civilization to be a participant in the interfaith networks. He's working to spread awareness of safeguarding of places of worship and worshippers. I'm pleased to say Hussam Adin Alim is joining us live from Cairo in Egypt. Hussam Adin, uh, Salaamu Alaikum, a very warm welcome uh, to the program. It's an absolute honor to have you on, sir. Uh, wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Mr. Muhammad. It's a great pleasure to be here with you and all our dear viewers uh, from across uh, the globe. Thank you so much uh, for the thoughtful introduction and for the kind of invitation uh, to be with you tonight. Uh, Allah bless you. Thank you so much. You're promoting yeah. protecting places of worship. Let's start at that. And mm -hmm. worshippers in the UN work that you're working on at the moment. What do you make of the attack on the Al-Aqsa Mosque? Uh, definitely, this is uh, an attack that cannot be justified by any means. Uh, all faith, faith traditions uh, cannot uh, condone it. Uh, all uh, international regulations, uh, all international conventions uh, totally stand uh, as a witness uh, to how uh, totally uh, this cannot be accepted. Especially because you are talking about uh, innocent, uh, totally unarmed, uh, worshippers who are only praying and they are totally innocent and I repeat and I highlight uh, how is it uh, it is they are totally innocent just praying just uh, uh, invocate invocating uh, at such a very important uh, time uh, for all Muslims and what adds more uh, injury uh, and uh, insult uh, to the bleeding is how is it we have seen and how is it uh, many uh, videos have been viral of how uh, some of uh, the illegal uh, settlers, they just say, if, 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 if it is not me who's going to take it, so someone else will come to take it, which is totally preposterous and, and totally provocative, not only for Muslims and Christians and Jews uh, who totally cannot uh, accept this, but to every and each uh, human yeah. being who can see the travesty uh, of this. Okay. And I'm sure uh, all uh, my friends, and I have done my, my master's uh, in the UK on diplomacy uh, and religion, they totally cannot accept this and they cannot uh, find any uh, legitimate uh, excuse or justification for okay. this. Um, um, but we saw in 2019 when Muslim worshippers were gunned down in Christchurch Mosque in New Zealand, um, and yeah. we saw it also in the church attacks in Sri Lanka. We've seen the anti-Semitic yes. attack against the synagogue. Is faith being deliberately targeted? Are places of worship deliberately targeted? Uh, definitely. Uh, when we look into uh, the timeline of, of the recent events and even beyond uh, Mr. Muhammad, we clearly see that uh, places of worship have been clearly uh, a target on the agenda uh, of the violently uh, extremist groups, but here I'd like to stress a very important point, and actually, actually, uh, uh, still from an academic perspective, which is a very important uh, work uh, by uh, a very well-known uh, academic uh, researcher, uh, and that's the book of the Myth of uh, Religious uh, Violence by William T. Kavanagh. And in this book, it clearly uh, shows how is it uh, this uh, idea that uh, faith or religion uh, is inherently driven to uh, stake flames of the virgin and, and drive uh, people apart happens actually to be nothing uh, but uh, uh, and totally unfounded uh, claim. So, of course, uh, faith or religion or the deen uh, plays a very important role in people's lives on many levels and of course uh, on the community level and um, and uh, even on a state level so this cannot be blamed on the places of worship yeah. themselves or on the worshipers rather uh, and this is uh, the point and this is uh, what al azhar and many uh, other global global institutions uh, have been uh, speaking uh, up to clarify uh, that places of worship, irrespective of uh, the faith 
uh, tradition that they belong to, they cannot be targeted uh, by any means, and there is nothing okay. that would uh, justify uh, targeting them or targeting the people uh, who seek uh, refuge uh, in them. Okay. It is true that... I, 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 I've uh, just got yeah. one more... Sorry, so sorry, uh, Hussam. I've got one more question, and we've got about a couple of minutes before the break. Uh, we sure. see terrorism on the rise around the world, and we often see minority communities targeted. Your country and Egypt has seen the Coptic Christians targeted often. What does Islam say about protecting minorities uh, within the Islamic system? Yes, this is a very interesting question, and, and we clearly see, as a matter of fact, uh, be it in Egypt and, and in other places, you always the, the, they are politically uh, motivated, and this is why uh, Al Azhar here in Egypt, alongside with uh, the Church as well in Egypt, they, they totally uh, condemn this, and they totally clarify that this uh, is not and cannot. Uh, actually be, be justified by any faith tradition, be it Islam or any other faith. Rather, it is always politically motivated in order to uh, create a, a situation of a divide, uh, in order to push forward certain political uh, agendas. Of course, this is a very important question. I'd like to, and of course, I'd like to highlight uh, this point uh, when it comes to the stance of uh, Islam on uh, safeguarding places of worship uh, and uh, worshippers. Uh, as well, we have various uh, proofs, as a matter of fact, from the Noble Quran and from uh, the authentic teachings uh, of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, that make it totally evident and explicit that it is not permissible by any means uh, to target uh, the safety of the places of worship uh, and worshippers, irrespective uh, of uh, the faith uh, tradition uh, that they belong to. And uh, we have in this regard, for instance, uh, the noble uh, Quranic verse in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that it is not permissible whatsoever to even express disrespect to uh, the deities of uh, non-Muslims. And commenting on this, the scholars okay. said that if it is uh, not yeah. allowed and utterly prohibited okay. to even show Osam, disrespect... Osam, can you just hold a thought there? Because we're coming towards our first break. When we come back, uh, Osam is going to stay with us. Uh, so we'll take a break and uh, some of these important messages uh, for your attention. Join us on the other side of this. Assalamu alaikum, welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV. Hussamuddin Alim joining us live from Cairo is still with us. And I just wanted to ask you that very important question. What is the prophetic way in terms of relationships with other faiths? Because interfaith workers come under a lot of criticism from within the Muslim community, but also other communities. Um, tell us about how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam interacting with other faiths? Uh, definitely, uh, I really appreciate uh, this question, Mr. Muhammad, because we really need to uh, emphasize uh, the model uh, of uh, the, 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 the perfect character of Prophet Muhammad, peace and, peace and blessings be upon him, uh, on this regard in particular. Uh, we have seen how is it uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, as a matter of fact, welcomed and hospitalized uh, a, dele a delegation of uh, Christians uh, from the Levant, and he welcomed them nowhere uh, in Medina, but in uh, the mosque itself of uh, the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. And we know how significant the mosque of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. And most uh, importantly, when it was the time uh, for uh, their prayer uh, as uh, Christian adherents, they, they were allowed, as a matter of fact, by the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, to uh, conduct and to carry out uh, their uh, rituals within the mosque of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. So if this uh, is telling of anything, it is definitely of uh, the moderate uh, teachings of Islam, the centrism uh, of uh, the, no the, the noble uh, Islamic uh, Sharia, which is the true face uh, that need to be uh, shown and reflected uh, and uh, thought about and uh, spoken uh, of. Uh, yeah. Of course, uh, I cannot uh, even uh, 
I keep pace with all uh, the, 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 the instances that come uh, to my mind with uh, this regard. But what I really would like to stress here in this regard is how is it, even when uh, there was a context of uh, a military uh, defense in order to protect uh, Muslims, the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, and also his uh, noble uh, successors, they would totally make it clear to the entire uh, army that they may not target any place uh, of worship yeah. uh, or uh, any uh, anyone who is conducting or yeah. secluding I, I was, him or I, himself in order to worship. Yeah. Hussam, I was reflecting on uh, that time when Hazrat Umar bin Khattab radiallahu mm -hmm. who entered Jerusalem yeah. And yeah. uh, the Christians offered the church for him to pray. Yeah. And he refused because he said he didn't want future generations to turn into a mosque. What can yeah. we in 21st century Britain or around the world in 2021 learn from that episode with Hazrat Umar? Yes, uh, let me provide some uh, more uh, context here in this regard for our dear viewers. And how is it? Uh, when uh, Muslims entered Jerusalem around the year 600 and uh, 37 AD, Omar may Allah be pleased, uh, Allah be pleased with him uh, as the second of the rightly guided uh, khalifas or successors uh, of the Prophet peace upon him, he was given a tour uh, of the city, uh, including the Church of uh, Holy Sepulchre. Uh, when the time and when the time for uh, the prayer uh, came, he was actually inside the mosque. And as you just mentioned, he was actually offered to pray within the church. But as a matter of fact, he didn't opt for this for fear that or lest upcoming generations or subsequent generations would think that this would stand as a, as a pretext for converting this uh, church uh, into a mosque. So if this to tell us uh, an important message, it would actually be uh, the fact that Muslims were not looking for uh, imposing uh, themselves, imposing their uh, pl places of worship at the cost of uh, the right uh, of others uh, to practice uh, their uh, yeah. not given uh, freedom of worship and definitely freedom of belief. And, and this is why just, just totally we thought that, sir. history yeah. uh, stands as a witness. Yeah, just totally thought that. Mm -hmm. I want to bring in a caller. Uh, if you want to join us, we're uh, live. 0192423108. Uh, sisters on the line. Let's welcome you to the programme. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum, sister. Asalaamu Alaikum and evening. Um, I just wanted to say that when you're talking about interfaith with religion, Normally, um, a lot of religious people that worship the Lord, and it's always to worship one Lord anyway, they don't, um, they don't want any troubles or racism or harm anybody. But when it comes to criminal, criminal organisations, they are the ones that we have to worry about because it's them that cause the corruption. If you've got criminals controlling the world and the UN and NATO, how is that going to help to make interfaith and peace in the world when they always have a different agenda for other stuff, that's what I wanted to put Thank forward. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment there, sister. Uh, nice to hear your voice as always. Um, so, Sam, let us be honest, uh, because that's what uh, the programme's all about. Relationships between Muslims yeah. and Jews have been challenged over these past few weeks of what's happened in Gaza. How can, how can the Jewish community, but the Muslim community as well, come together despite those divisions? Uh, definitely, I think uh, the distinction is, is clear and, and can clearly be uh, drawn between uh, the practices of the Zionist entity and what Jews uh, are all uh, about and what uh, Ju Judaism uh, as a faith uh, tradition uh, is all about. We read in, in, the, in the traditions uh, of Judaism uh, that the whole of the, of the, of the Torah is for uh, the purpose of uh, making peace. And of course, we know the, the, the stance of a very important uh, Jewish group, which is Natori Karta, uh, with regards to uh, the, the Zionist occupation of uh, the Palestinian uh, territories. So uh, we do, as a matter of fact, emphasize the fact that, that uh, the illegal, uh, discriminatory, uh, apartheid practices of the Zionist entity do not reflect uh, what uh, Judaism uh, is about and cannot by any means 
uh, be justified uh, to target uh, innocent, peace-loving uh, Jews. Um, and, and let me also stri stress here a, a very important uh, point, uh, and that's the fact that Muslims were never known uh, to be supporters uh, of a notion like uh, anti-Semitism or targeting Jews. Rather, we read in history, how is it, uh, when uh, Muslims were governing uh, Andalusia, nowadays uh, Spain, they were able to live together, to flourish, and to contribute uh, to uh, the society, and how it, it was a beacon of light and civilization for uh, not only the entirety of Europe, or the entirety of Europe, but for the whole world, and how it in uh, the persecution started by the Catholic Church back then, the Jews themselves had to feel uh, with uh, Muslims. So we cannot uh, afford to uh, forget that, uh, to forget this, uh, or to forget how Muslims uh, ensured the safety uh, of all uh, the followers of uh, all faith traditions when they entered so many uh, lands. So of course, yeah. uh, we totally stand against any form of uh, targeting uh, Jews or or Judaism or the teachings of Prophet Moses, uh, peace and blessings be upon him. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to ask you, you've been doing lots of work uh, on TV in Cairo, in Egypt, uh, for Middle Eastern broadcasters. Tell us about how you're finding that and um, how was it during Ramadan doing all this TV work? Uh, sorry, uh, could you repeat that because I have a technical issue. With sorry, I'm just saying uh, you've done lots of uh, TV programs uh, on mm -hmm. Middle East TV in uh, in the Middle East. How, how are you finding that? Yeah, definitely. I, I do think that uh, all Muslims have a responsibility uh, to speak up, uh, to clarify uh, the noble uh, teachings of Islam in order to create, in order to contribute uh, to uh, building a discourse. Uh, and a narrative that uh, speaks truly of Islam and a narrative that really is representative uh, of Muslims uh, around the globe. We know that um, uh, there have been several campaigns uh, in order to tarnish uh, the image of uh, Muslims and Islam itself as a, 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 a mercy uh, loving and sharing uh, faith tradition. But of course, uh, all of us uh, have uh, a responsibility uh, to do our best, of course, in the most civilized, uh, law-abiding way uh, to yeah. speak uh, truth against this and to clarify uh, the true okay. teachings and the, and, the, and the truthful teachings okay. uh, of Islam. Uh, uh, we, we are taking some calls as well, so 01924 if you want to get in touch with the program. Let's go to the brother who's calling on the phone. Salaam alaikum. Wa alaikum as -salam. Welcome, Welcome, my dear brother. What would you like to say, sir? Um, I'd like to just um, make things absolutely clear for everybody um, that's watching. You mentioned um, interface and how they can, uh, maybe the interface dialogue and the scholars can help address the issues um, around the world regarding the United Nations. Um, your respective guest there is, is there, but he knows this and I know this and you do this. The UN have failed on a... Um, international level, forgetting to face the religious dimension, just on a national dimension, on a humanitarian dimension. The evidence is there. Just look at the pandemic for the last 12 months. What has the UN done to actually get the um, coronavirus jabs, mm. um, the vaccinations out to everybody in the world? It's a failed organisation. If at this time it couldn't get its act together for the sake of humanity, it's not going to do anything for anybody's any religion or culture or gender. It's not going to happen. And it's a, it's a wake up call for all of us to look at the UN and see this organization is, is not fit for purpose. It has failed us in this pandemic. That is my message to everybody around the world. You know, Thank wake you. up. Thank you so much. Thank you for your call. A uh, really important point there about the United Nations, which we'll try to cover uh, a bit later. Um, and just We've got about five minutes, and so I just wanted to get a couple of questions uh, in around uh, around that work, uh, the UN Alliance for Civilization. You're doing some work uh, with them. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I really appreciate this question, and thank you so much for raising this point. Uh, but uh, at the very outset, let me stress a very important point, and that I'm, I'm not here uh, in the capacity of being a representative of the UN or anybody uh, of uh, the UN. 
of course, we, we, we all uh, know that there are many challenges facing the UN uh, in implementing its, its own charter and even uh, the bodies that are affiliated with the, with the UN. But this, of course, uh, will not uh, dissuade uh, us from doing our best with all uh, stakeholders and concerned uh, international uh, bodies in order to do our best uh, for uh, humanity and for the global uh, human family. Uh, with that being said, yes, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best as a participant in the project. And I do, as a matter of fact, uh, appreciate uh, the efforts uh, of uh, the coordinators uh, in this regard. I think we are all uh, our, uh, are doing uh, our best to bring about uh, a more enlightened uh, understanding and awareness of, of, of many important issues when it comes to interfaith. And one of them, of course, and this is uh, what I'm uh, dedicating uh, my campaign uh, for, and that's to raise awareness when it comes to the importance of uh, safeguarding uh, places of uh, worship uh, and uh, worshippers. Uh, another very important point that I'd also like uh, to stress here is the fact that we are always uh, motivated and driven primarily by the teachings of the Noble Quran as Muslims and by the teachings of the Pro Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings uh, be uh, upon him. These are the teachings of Islam because uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly uh, tells us uh, in the Noble Quran, لا ينهاكم الله عن الذين لم يقاتلكم في الدين ولم يخرجكم من ديارهم أن تبروهم وتقصدوا ليهم. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forbid you from showing uh, at most kindness and yeah. uh, courtesy towards those who did not uh, fight you uh, on the on the basis of your faith or has driven you out of your homes. So yeah. this is the, the the teaching and the stance of the Prophet okay. and the Quran and the Noble Quran uh, on this regard. And even here, I'd like to stress how the Quran uses the term "bir," which is actually the way how a Muslim individual a man or a woman is required to treat their own parents. So you see here the way how the Quran is encouraging and urging us to treat a non-Muslim fellow human being is exactly the same way how a Muslim is encouraged to treat to treat or to deal with uh, their own uh, parents. And of course, okay. we know how uh, significant it is yeah. to be with one's parents. Uh, I've got my final question. Uh, what, what does the future hold of Sam? What, what, after obviously this UN thing that you're doing, Alliance Civilization, uh, what, what's next in your journey? Uh, of course, uh, we are always uh, optimistic. We are always hopeful uh, in uh, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings to us. Uh, our duty is not uh, to change everything. Rather, our, our duty is to do our uh, best and uh, to remain uh, steadfast uh, on the path until we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, so this is my message to all my, our dear viewers and especially uh, to the Muslim uh, young people that each and every one of us has uh, a duty and a responsibility to be uh, reflective ambassadors of the noble teachings of Islam, the mercy of the teachings of Islam and uh, the compassionate uh, teachings of Islam. Yeah. Well, uh, Hussam, thank you so much. It's an absolute honor to have you on the program. Um, and I look forward to welcoming you back at a future show. Likewise. Thank you so much for having me. I'll keep you safe and uh, love to the family. Uh, that was Hussam Uddin Alim, who's an imam and scholar from the Al Azhar University, who's joining us live there from Cairo uh, in Egypt, reflecting on the sense uh, that, yes, there is some division here. Let's be honest with each other. We can't hide away from that division. And it doesn't do any good to the Jewish community or the Muslim community that we hide that division. What it can do is how we address those divisions and how we can come together and deal with common issues. When we come back, we head to Blackburn to talk to Councillor Shokat Hussain. Join us on the other side of these very important messages. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum, welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV. I want to open the lines now for you to share your thoughts about not just what was going on in Gaza, but actually uh, some really important point. The brother from, um, I don't know where he was from, but he, he dialed in talking about the failure of the international community, the international 
order that was set up in the aftermath of World War II, in which you had five permanent members, which were the United Kingdom, France, the United States, um, Russia, and who was the other one? China. They, they established themselves as permanent members of the United Nations and everybody else. Would, they would have veto power. And that's why when you saw during the crisis uh, in Gaza, where the violence in Gaza and Israel, you saw the United States uh, blocking uh, any attempt to have a unified statement from the Security Council. And then you see it in the other side as well, when China, for example, um, when there was an attempt to get a statement on uh, Myanmar, um, and Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, obviously the former leader who's been detained in that military coup in Burma, um, when they tried to introduce a statement uh, to condemn that military coup, um, it was China that was blocking that. Russia, who is also a veto member of the United Nations, was doing the same when it came to Syria. And so there's a lot of playing the game here. And the brother was absolutely right when he said that international order looks like to have um, you know, failed. And that is something that we need to have a look at. 019242310833, if you want to share the conversation. How can the United Nations really be called United Nations when member states in this state are killing children, women around the world uh, in their military campaigns? And I'm not talking just about Israel here. I'm talking about some of those Arab countries. I'm talking about what happened in Syria. Uh, where there is a presidential election apparently going on uh, despite um, so many years, nine years uh, of violence in that country. And so that is something that we all need to reflect on. How can we, how can we as a community of nations come together on a common interest? Uh, and that's in regards to human dignity, human rights and justice and fairness. Now, the Israelis will uh, certainly, uh, the Israeli government will certainly say that they were responding uh, to rockets from Hamas um, and Islamic Jihad and other uh, military groups in Gaza. And if only the rockets stopped, the Israeli military strikes would stop. And the Palestinians would argue that they are living in an open air prison in which things in and out, access in and out uh, into Egypt, uh, sorry, in, via the Rafah crossing uh, or the Erez crossing, which is the Israeli um, and the Kalam um, crossing, which is for goods. And that when you live in that environment, when people don't have any hope, don't have an alternative, peaceful way to react and challenge uh, occupation um, or restrictions placed on by neighboring countries. And so that, that is the dynamic that you're working in. But you've also got to take something else into consideration. And this is where um, I want to ask you to share your thoughts on this, is that that peace process is missing. The process in terms of trying to get the Israelis and the Palestinians to talk and have meaningful talks uh, where you can have a viable Palestinian state alongside an Israel, which already exists. There's no point talking about Israel rights to exist because they exist. But this is about giving the Palestinians their state and tackling the underlying issues why we are that at this stage. And so it's a big global game and people are criticizing, and the brother was right. People are criticizing the United Nations because they've not been able to deal with that. Uh, we saw the inaction in Syria. Uh, we saw the chaos that we see in Libya. And there's lots of countries like Germany, uh, like Ireland and Canada and Australia and India who would like the institutions of the United Nations to go through some renewal and some change. And that is something uh, that we uh, want to talk about. Now, last week we had the pleasure of Councillor Tiger Patel and he was here telling us his journey uh, to become a candidate and to win. And the story of Labour in the recent local elections has been a disaster, some would argue. 11 years of a Conservative government that should have been making progress and winning councillors and control of councils. 
They lost a seat of Hartipool in that parliamentary by-election to the Conservatives and had a net loss of over 200 councillors. Is this the end of Labour and what now for Keir Starmer? Councillor Shokot Hussain represents a ward in Blackburn and is a regular contributor to British Muslim TV. Pleased to say Councillor Shokot Hussain is joining us live from Blackburn. Shokot Hussain, Salaam Alaikum, welcome to the programme. Uh, thank you for having me on. Yeah, it's, good. Uh, it's great to have you on again. Uh, let's start very quickly um, about the victory of Tiger Patel. We've got about 90 seconds and we'll come back to you after the break. Uh, let's start the victory of Tiger Patel in Blackburn. That was previously a rock solid Labour seat. What went wrong for your party? went wrong, to be honest. We were concentrating on two seats that we wanted to win. But I want to congratulate Tiger. Uh, I strong believe in democracy. If that's what the people voted for, that's what they got. Um, you've met him now. And we, we've got a plan. We just need to get back up, dust ourselves down. And uh, inshallah, I think we'll win the seat back. But do you think it was a mistake to underestimate the Tiger? No, no, I... Firstly, I didn't underestimate it. I could see the signs because what the candidate we had, we didn't run a pretty good campaign, to be honest, but there was quite a few things that went against us. She's uh, She was shielding and helping her parents as well mm. in the bubble, and that stopped us. And mm. our strength is interaction on the doorstep. We yeah. had but, there, but there was also complacency from the Labour Party, and arrogance to think this was our seat we're going to keep hold of it and nothing's going to stop us. Look, you, I know you're going to stay with us. We're going to take a break. We're going to come back. We're going to carry on the conversation. Yes, this, the show is about the Labour Party reaction and the local elections. Join us on the other side of these important messages. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV. I'm still joined by Councillor Shoko Hussain. Uh, and Councillor Shoko Hussain, we were, I was hearing from local sources in the ward that the Labour Party was complacent. They didn't rake Tiger Patel. They thought um, he was a joke. No, no, but no, no, your no. party's uh, not laughing now, are you? No, 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 we're not laughing, but I'm, I'm saying we never took it lightly. Uh, there was a few circumstances which went against us, and as you're probably aware, when you go on these courses well, about problem solving, when they all come together, it's, it's a disaster, and that's what happened to us. Mm -hmm. Our strength, as, as I was saying earlier, is that interaction to face to face, which we couldn't have. We like to hand deliver leaflets. It was very late in the day before we could do it. We never got out there to put our side of the story. He was very strong on social media. I give him that, but the truth. And nobody lets, you know, media don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. And the fact is, he never sent one single email to the council about any work. All that work was not getting done was sadly... Oh, well, are you going to take all the credit for this now? No, I'm not taking credit. I'm just saying it's a matter of fact that even that swing you talked about was the work of our predecessor, Mariam, who spent a lot of work in the months beforehand. Yeah. That actually but... worked done on the election day itself. But he started to understand uh, the power of social media. Uh, he has these videos uh, of the, uh, the rubbish uh, being piled up and repairs and then shows videos of the action being taken. Now, let's just look at the national picture, if I may, Councillor Shokot Hussain. You would think that the Tories been in power for 11 years, the Labour would be ahead, not just in the polls, but actually winning elections. But you're going backwards. Is this the end of Labour? No, no, I think we in the process of rebuilding, to be honest. I think Kirstana took over in the middle of a pandemic, and it's not been easy for him. I'm not making excuses. We should be a lot better. But I think we need to go back to basic, go back to our roots, go back out there and uh, consult the people and find out what it is that they want and rebuild from there. Because if you look, uh, our record when we're actually in government, We've done some great things. You know, after the Second World War, we were the ones going to do social security, build brand new council houses, the yeah. NHS. These are landmarks, you know, you can't yeah. take that away from us. And in 97 to 2010, again, we, we actually record investment in NHS, more doctors, more nurses, better schools. Uh, we introduced the minimum wage, um, more jobs, better jobs. Yeah. 
even devolved power in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, and the Good Friday Agreement. So, you know, yeah. we've done some brilliant things. Have you ever... Have you ever thought of copying Tiger Patel and doing that viral video without the uh, explicit content at the end? No, well, social media is the future. Um, I, actually, he, he still thinks it was him that got the million views. I'm not sure it was, but I think it was the picture. But um, good luck to no, him. No, it, it, it was just something different. And the reason it catched on was because, yes, you know, for us who, who are linked with Pakistan, the Tabdili Imran Khan sort of uh, campaign song. But actually, here was somebody who was just being simple and straight. He was on last week. He said, he, you know, he's a conservative because he wanted to win. And he's proven that. Yeah. Um, he said something today which is slightly going against him. He's sort of sporting arms going to Israel because he's not really too bothered. And that's slowly he's turning. But, uh, you know, good yeah, but to, your, your, your party hasn't got a good record when it comes to... Uh, 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 supporting the Palestinians, let's be honest. No, no, no. but what I'm saying is, um, ours is better than the Conservatives. Is it? Well, so, I mean, so, I don't understand, your leader, Keir Starmer, just didn't have the guts to speak out on Palestine last week. He didn't condemn the killing of, of children in Gaza last week and uh, let he, the Prime Minister off the hook on it. He did make a statement, and I'm not going to make excuses. It was late in the day. Uh, as was most of our, our shadow cabinet. But remember, we, uh, for some reason, we started a reshuffle of our shadow cabinet while the results were still coming in. Yeah. Now, I have no idea why that happened. But Lisa Nandi, who is our foreign secretary, was a, you know, she's very vocal. She's, I think, the chair of the Palestine and Middle Eastern group. She's very, very respected, mm. very vocal on Palestine. Yeah. But, but, you know, I, I'm sure you you saw her name was being mentioned about possibly moving her. So I, I can understand why she didn't make a statement because she didn't know if she had a job or not. So for well, once she... Do, 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 do you think that the Labour Party can stop this bleeding? Because we, we all thought in 2019 in that general election, historic defeat for the Labour Party, that was like, you know, right at the bottom of it. But you seem to be breaking new records every year. If we don't go back to our We're working not in a good class, way. If we don't go back to our working classes, our work, you know, our roots, we were born out of the unions. And if we're not going back there, consulting them, listening to them, because there's two two aspects. One's the pandemic, the other one was Brexit. And Starmer came in on, on, on the slogan that he was going to unite the party. And he needs to do that. Yeah. And if you do, then I'm afraid, you know, we're going to be struggling. Okay, but, and then and, and then, what can the National Party learn from local leaders like you that are active and engaged with communities? Can you hear me? Just about, yeah. Sorry, I'm just going to say, what, what can the National Party learn from local leaders like you? Well, I think we are getting engaging. We've set up some groups and think tanks, and you know we need to feed into that. Uh, we need to get active. We need to pull our points forward on all issues, and really engage with the party. And I think they are looking. They're reaching out now. And uh, the other good move he's made is he's got Shibana Mahmood as, as the campaign coordinator, and I'm sure she'll do pretty well. Yeah, um, and then there's been lots of criticism of your leader Keir Starmer, and that botched reshuffle that you were referring to. Are you heading for a second historic defeat at the next general election? Well, um, I don't know if you notice in the Queen's speech, they've actually abolished the, um, you know, the parliament where they had a fixed parliament. Yeah, fixed term parliament bill, yeah. They've abolished that. So I, I, I suspect we won't have a full parliament and the election will be a lot sooner than... Yeah, but you'll probably that. lose anyway, so there's no point worrying about whether the bill's going to pass or not. Well, if you look at... If we can go, like I said, we do the work. And if you listen to what Cummings said today, and if we can tackle them on that, you know, it's horrendous. Some of the stuff that's coming out is just unbelievable. People have died, you know, and that must have been hard work for somebody who's had a loved one passed away during the pandemic. And listening to some of the stuff that was coming out today is just, you know, it's frightening. Yeah. Um what do you make of, and obviously we, we, we sadly talked to you again during the pandemic and, 
you know, we look at the positive cases that have been rising over the year in Blackburn. Last time we spoke, there was obviously issues then. Now we've got this Indian variant, which is coming from India. Um, what do you make of the rise in Blackburn? And what's your plea to people within our communities to please, for goodness sake, follow the rules and stay at home? Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm saying um, don't be complacent. We've got guidance from the government, which was to stay in. Um, don't let other people come to your house which is against the actual law, which says you can allow up to six people or two families. But we are saying take precautions, um, get vaccinated and keep going out testing. We have lots of testing, uh, free you know, testing kits out there if you want. And just to look after yourself and stick to that two meter distance if you can. And even when you're out in public spaces, make sure you wear a mask. So that message is still going out there. And um, to be honest with you, um, I'm a bit disappointed on quite angry that India wasn't put in red list a lot sooner than it should have been mm. um, because that uh, you probably were shouting the loudest. Um, I did, yeah. I'm just surprised know, nobody listened to me. I was banging on about it for weeks. Absolutely. So had they stopped it, I don't know, three weeks earlier, we might have been uh, in a better position mm. today. In, in Brisbane, it is quite high at the moment. So it is, yeah, yeah. It's shockingly high. And, and places like Bolton as well, which is massive. Um, yeah. Obviously, we need our communities to take this vaccine because it now proves that if you get the vaccine, you are protected, uh, not from not getting the virus, but actually getting serious steel and ending up in hospital and needing you know, to be put on a ventilator and things like that. It protects you from that sort of thing. Have you taken uh, the vaccine and what's your advice to our communities? I took my first year, but I'm going for my second one next week. Um, I'm, I've actually been advocating it right from the off uh, because that's the way out. But, you know, uh, we've got a real reflection because our cemetery, we had a new parcel of land and it's full. It's full. If you just, you know, the visual, if you want it, you just go to the cemetery. So I think that really did take a lot of people uh, back because you could actually visually see the impact it's had on us yeah. as a small community. So, you know, the message is going home. We're telling everybody, even the youngsters, I think they were very reluctant, uh, but of late, I think they've started taking it. Just this last week, we've had loads of pop-up surgeries. The you have, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you know, hopefully we can keep on top of it. Yeah, we can hopefully and, and hopefully get a way to get the message out to people that, you know, take this vaccine, they will protect you and your loved ones. I suppose um, my final question to you is there's lots of people, not surprisingly, on the right of our politics, like commentators and politicians who are now blaming BME communities, um, including a former cabinet minister saying, well, it's these ethnics uh, that have caused this Indian variant. What would you say in reaction to that inflammatory comments that we're hearing? Oh, that's rubbish. That's not true because, you know, there was a phase earlier on uh, during the pandemic about, I don't know, six, seven months ago where they tried this. And then, you know, the actual, um, I, I get regular reports from the hospital. We work very close with the hospital, you see. And we know there were a lot more white people at one stage than there were Asians. So I, I, I don't believe in that. There is uh, a culture thing that we have to get used to very quickly because we do, whether it's weddings, funerals, or mosques, we, we do congregate a lot. But that was a culture thing that we had to get used to, and it was difficult. But we got the message home, you know. Uh, but I don't, for one minute, uh, accept that. No chance. Yeah. And uh, how optimistic are you for the future for your town? I'm very optimistic. I think, you know, we've got a next few weeks is very critical for us because, you know, the, this Indian variant is hitting us. There's quite a lot of people who've been testing positive. But luckily, you know, it's not life-threatening yet. They've got it, I don't know whether they're young or because they've been vaccinated. Um, but the fact that we're testing more is giving us the opportunity identifying it. But it is, it, I think for some reason, it just spread a lot quicker than the last variant here. Mm, yeah, it is. And, and But the positive is that the uh, vaccines do provide that element of protection. Uh, Councillor Shukar Tussin, it's always a pleasure uh, to hear from you and I hope uh, we can join together again uh, in a future show uh, when things are better. After the break, we head to Paris to talk to Hamid Greet. Join us on the other side of this.
Assalamu alaikum, welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq, exclusively on British Muslim TV. Yes, I know I'm keeping myself in between me and the football. Yes, I know, it's 1-1. Uh, Manchester United versus Villarreal, uh, which is uh, in the Europa League final, obviously. Um, so yeah, I'll keep you updated if any good news comes uh, from there. But uh, obviously, we'll be going to Paris very shortly, talk to Hamid Greet, uh, around who's a political economist about President Macron and his campaign, um, in which he, the president himself, says, this is not a war against Islam, this is a war against Islamism and war against political violence uh, perpetuated uh, by those uh, who are using it as an excuse um, it, it, to use violence. Uh, where lots of French Muslim organizations and imams are saying uh, that the president uh, is deliberately using this to stoke fears of the Muslim community. And he's lurching to the right because he's got that challenge once again from Marine Le Pen from Front National, um, who uh, he beat in the last presidential election. So I think... Um, this is the moment uh, that we uh, all want to see um, in regards to where we are, if you like, um, in terms of the politics. Because obviously President Macron faces a presidential election next year in 2022. Um, and obviously a divided politics in which Marine Le Pen is making great progress in terms... Of, I say great progress, I don't want to endorse that. I just mean great progress um, compared to where she was say, uh, four years ago. And it'll be interesting to see how that happens. Now, when President Macron stood as a third party candidate in the presidential election, he stood on a centrist uh, platform that appealed to moderates with equality, a strong feature of his campaign, took inspiration from President Barack Obama in the United States. Many thought it was a significant moment of change. But once in office, he's been accused of pushing a right wing agenda with consequences for ordinary French people. When the school teacher Samuel Paty was killed last year, President Macron declared a war on Islamism, but French Muslims have claimed it is in reality a war on Islam. Hamid Crete is a freelance political consultant. He's based in Paris and has been outspoken on these issues, uh, on the new changes to the law as well. I'm pleased to say Hamid uh, joining us live from Paris in France. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and uh, very warm welcome to the show, Hamid. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you so much for inviting me. How are you, Brother Mohammed Shafiq? I'm very good. I'm really glad that we finally get to have this conversation. Yeah, thank you so much. Me too. Uh, tell us about President Macron's centrist platform during the 2017 election. Was he all a con just to get elected? Yeah, President Macron, when he had been elected in 2017, he was a new uh, president. He was a new face for the youth generation. Uh, the, it, uh, the, 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 there was a hope for the French New Generation, particularly for the Muslim community, when he gave a new speech, a new references, a new uh, French history, a new pathway, for the, uh, a new vision as well for the French uh, generation. So he had been uh, elected in 2017 when he promises a lot of things and a lot of reform, such as the economic reform, the uh, tackling the inequality and also uh, 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 fighting the discrimination. So uh, President Macron, uh, in conclusion, he was a new, uh, a new French and as well a young uh, president mm. in the French history that uh, 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 promises a lot of changes. But unfortunately, today people are, are, have been uh, deceived by his uh, action and mm. they realize mm. that uh, there is a lot of uh, misunderstanding with the French president and a lot of deceptions, yeah. as I can say. Yeah, and, and he won a comfortable majority against Marie Le Pen, uh, and he's won a majority in the parliamentary elections as well later on. But he's very much of the political establishment. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, I do agree with you, but uh, uh, with a few details that I would like to, to, uh, to underline. Uh, today, uh, uh, France uh, is, uh, is, uh, is in a very bad situation, I would say. There is a right uh, extremely party, as you know. And uh, the electors today uh, have been, uh, 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 I will say, changing their mind because of the TV. They have been lobotomized, as I can use this uh, this word. Lobot lobotomy is in French, we say lobotomized as well yeah. in English. So uh, there is a confrontation between the extreme party and his majority. When he had been elected in 2017, 
uh, nobody was uh, th there was as well the same uh, the same uh, parliamentary uh, mm. system which the left like in UK and the right parties and Macron was the new face was a new candidate who promises a lot of change and uh, Marie Le Pen was the candidate against the system Macron uh, 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 followed his pathway when he debated with her for in the second round against her uh, we've seen that Marie Le Pen was destabilized by Macron she couldn't uh, of course uh, uh, answer to the economic uh, question against Macron. Macron is, uh, do not forget, he's a banker and he, uh, he is very uh, uh, knowledgeable about the economy and about the global economic system. So uh, this is the, 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 weak, the weakness of Marine Le Pen. That's why she has lost, unfortunately. But today, the French mm. elector and the French people uh, uh, are very uh, angry against the French president. Uh, more than uh, 10 millions of employment uh, have been uh, get out, uh, have got out of the job. They, they have lost the, the jobs. And uh, the, the, as you know, the, the COVID-19... The, sort of the aftermath of the yeah. pandemic as well. So to interrupt that, I just want to take a call as well. has also increased the inequality in France mm. considerably and effectively. So today we have a, yeah. a, a portrait which is very bad in France. And uh, unfortunately... The, the extreme party is uh, in a very powerful uh, force and very good position today. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about Marie Le Pen and her chances uh, later on in the programme. But um, let's take that call. Sister, if you want to join the conversation, if you've got a question for Hamid, uh, 01924231083. Uh, sister is on the line. Salaam alaikum, sister. Um, Salaam alaikum. Um, it was just to say, it was about the other um, previous, about the vaccination. I was going to make a small point about when they do the blame gaming to say it's India and it's immigration or not immigration, sorry, if it's something to do with other nationality, um, it's because of other DNA mm. to blame us and play the guessing game as if they know better than the Lord that they have to blame okay. people. So, and also because now you're talking about the French stuff, I wanted to say, but if you put your reliance on human beings and you start worshipping them, they just, they're not going to give you the result like the okay. Lord Allah will give you. Okay, thank you so much uh, for adding uh, those words that you wanted to. Uh, so, Hamid, um, what was the reaction in, in France to the murder of Samuel Paty? Yeah, as you know, the episode of Samuel Paty has considerably increased Islamophobia after the murder, the, uh, the atrocity of this murder that all the French Muslim community have been condemned. Uh, this murder, this barbaric murder. After that, uh, the, uh, President Macron uh, had proposed a new bill, which is called uh, the separatists, which uh, were unfortunately targeting the French Muslim community and mixing uh, between the extremists and the majority of the French Muslims who are, who are Muslim and very, as, as, I, as I, I can say, moderate. The, the, even if I, don't want, if I don't like using this term, because moderate Muslim, it doesn't mean anything for me and for the old Muslim. We cannot, we, we don't call a Christian a moderate Christian or Jewish, <laughs> Jewish, a moderate Jewish. But for Muslim, we, we call it as an Islamist, etc. I don't want to go through the concept of Islamism. As you know, there is, a, I think, 200 definition of it, according to the United Nations and the many commissions and intellectuals that uh, had written many books about these topics. But... After the Samuel Paty, there is a kind of uh, Islamophobia and atmosphere against the French uh, Muslim community and the president, unfortunately, in, in this bill, uh, uh, who had been voted by the French parliament, he didn't, uh, of course, fight the Islamophobia. He, have, he has seen only one, one way, and, and about Islamophobia, he didn't take in his bill this, uh, these topics, which is very important. How to today fight the extremist uh, Muslim is is you have to fight also the Islamophobia because the extremists use this Islamophobia by saying that, look, you are not French or you are not British, you are not European citizens as a Muslim. Look, they don't want you. You cannot be integrated. And that's why, as you know, the extremists use as well uh, this topic. That's why it's very important today at the same time to fight, to fight sorry, mm -hmm. the extremists, but also to fight the Islamophobia and to, to, to show that the French Muslim people are integrated in the French society, the, uh, the British Muslims are integrated in, in Britain, yeah. in UK. Yeah. And this is very important. You cannot have only one standard, okay. you know, 
these double standard as, as British said. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm so in, it's we, very important. We've got about... let me let, let me just finish about that. After that, as you know, the President Macron had uh, uh, had given an uh, an interview when he said during his speech that Islam is in crisis. After that, we have an episode, the second episode that we had a boycott in the Muslim world and the many protesters uh, had an anger against the French mm. president okay. uh, saying that Islam is in crisis. I would say that Islam have, has never been in crisis. Uh, uh, Islam is Islam as according to the Sunnah in the Quran and the all Muslim know what is Islam. We don't need anyone to teach us mm. what is Islam. What we need today is to fight the Islamophobia and to fight the inequality and racism in our society, particularly okay. in Europe. Uh, this is thank not you, thank you, uh, Hamid. But it's all... I'm, I'm just conscious of time as well. I've got a couple of minutes. I want to get a caller in, and then I just wanted to ask you another question, uh, if possible. Let's go to the lines. Who's online? One, salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, uh, Hamid, brother and, and brother Shafiq. The question I wanted to ask: um, Just think of me as someone who believes in liberty and equality. Um, in France, obviously, they, they've banned um, the head um, scarf for the sisters, and it seems like Germany is also is heading in that direction to ban the head scarf for the sisters as well. So, where are we heading with Europe? I mean, we have these um, anthems of liberty and equality, but where, where, what, what's going on as a libertarian? I'm yeah. a bit worried as to what's going on. Yeah, because there seems to be uh, Hamid. There's a there's a there's a conflict there, isn't there, with sort of equality, liberty, individual. Rights, but these curtailing the rights, laws being passed which specifically target the Muslim community. President Macron, thank you for, uh, to the caller. President Macron proposed a global security bill to counter terrorism. What, what is wrong with the bill? We've got about 60 seconds. Yes, of course. This bill had been proposed by the French president one month ago. He, the, he, he, he doesn't allow people to uh, film. The police, if because of the police brutality, there were a third episode that one black guy has been uh, 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 has been attacked by the police. They there were police brutality against him, and that's why the French pre president responded, uh, uh, despite of responding a very good answer against the racism. Mm. He <laughs> did the opposite. He gave for the French police, you know, the right, and it was not allowed. And I would like that the the higher uh, right council. Uh, 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 has uh, has abandoned uh, okay. seven articles. Just just pause there, Hamid. Pause there, my friend. We're going to take a very quick break. When we come back, we'll continue the conversation uh, with Hamid Creech, uh, who's joining us from Paris. See you shortly. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohamed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV. If you want to know the football score, is Villa uh, Villa Real. Uh, one Manchester United one. It's in the eighty fourth minute, and so obviously, um, it's not sports talk. But come on, you know if you if I'm if I'm here and uh, unable to watch United, then um, I, at least I can get a plug in of the football score. But yeah, it's uh, sports t uh, talk is back on Friday, ten p.m. So I'll be tuning in. Uh, are you going to be tuning in uh, and supporting uh, that fantastic program? Uh, so anyway, thank you so much. Uh, Hamid is still with us uh, in Paris. Uh, thank you so much, my dear friend. It's great to have you as well. Can you tell us Thanks. what's the latest on this bill? Because there's been lots of suspensions. There's been uh, issues around what's going to happen with the bill. Can you tell us where we are in terms of the bill? As it yeah, the bill, yeah, the, 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 the sake of the bill was uh, effectively to, to, uh, to not allow, uh, you know, the citizens that can that can uh, film the police brutality and that's why the higher council uh, has uh, has refused this uh, this bill uh, one week ago and uh, and the sake of this bill was uh, was very important for for the liberties and for the freedom uh, many uh, commentators have criticized and journalists uh, because they gave the all right to the police uh, people could not uh, today criticize the police brutality in, in Paris by filming, by taking uh, pictures. Uh, when uh, we've seen in the streets how uh, police, how I will not generalize, but uh, for a few uh, uh, policemen, police officer to uh, uh, to brutalize uh, people in the street. And that's why it was very important. There were two strikes against this bill. 
but unfortunately, despite of uh, of going uh, on strike, uh, Macron uh, was uh, did not uh, come back for for his bill. But the higher council uh, has uh, uh, has abandoned this this bill. Uh, more than over than uh, eight articles have been uh, uh, reformed or changed, and uh, it was uh, obviously a defeat for the French president. And they will have a new law, new new proposal, which will go mm. through the the French Parliament by uh, Gérard Damanin, the Minister of uh, the Interior of Minister uh, in France. I know you've taken, uh, you've agreed to take some questions as well. So zero one nine two four two three one zero eight three. If you've got a question for our dear friend uh, Hamid uh, joining us from Paris, reflecting on President Macron and life for French Muslims. Um, so as I said. Um, what has uh, French Muslims' reaction been to, been to the bill? The French Muslim community, of course, uh, they, they are the first who, who had been uh, targeted by the police. As you know, there are many, uh, there are many uh, uh, French Arabics originally from, from Arab country, North Africa or West Africa or black people, they, who are targeting uh, mostly because they live in the suburb. And the many suburbs, they have many problems, inequality, discrimination. Uh, uh, during the French history, people have been uh, uh, packed on this, uh, on many uh, buildings. So there is not, I mean, a, equal, a territorial equality between, uh, between many regions in France and many areas. So I believe that uh, the, the French, the Muslim French people uh, have been also uh, going uh, on, uh, on strike and they criticize this bill to, uh, to denounce this uh, this police brutality by going on strike with many organizations, human rights organizations such as such as Amnesty International, Human Rights, and many uh, European organizations. Uh, it's obviously a defeat for the French president. Uh, many 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 human rights organizations, and in particular in United Nations and Europe, uh, they have been uh, alerting uh, the French president of the dangerosity and the danger of this uh, of this law. So the French president now he knows that he made a, I think a huge mistake and even for the image of the, the the country of human rights as they call it. So I believe that today is a huge defect for the French president, and we will see uh, what mm. will be the proposal uh, for the French majority en marche. Now the question we asked uh, is: Is this Macron's war on Islam? How do, how would you answer that question? I think, as he said in Al Jazeera, because you, he, for those for, for our viewers who don't know, you you used to advise him. You were certainly aware yeah. of him as a as as, as, a, as a as a politician and as a minister. I advised him unofficially, unofficially when he was uh, uh, when he's uh, yes when when the, there were many crises such as the yellow vest uh, uh, crisis in France. So uh, of course, in Al Jazeera, when he did his interview, he said. He delivered a speech with Al, with Al Jazeera uh, for, during the, his interview, and he said that he's, he's not in one Islam. But what is his problem, and I said it to him many times, is the, about the Islamophobia. Uh, the problem now with this majority is not to take seriously the Islamophobia and the discrimination. Today we have many uh, French Muslim sisters that they wear hijab, they cannot even work because of the hijab. And this is, is a huge problem. Country who said that he's a human rights country and, uh, and is not able to integrate and to give the job for this uh, French Muslim lady who, are, who have been a graduate, they have a master in all topics in France. So I believe today if uh, Macron is not on war uh, against Islam, uh, I believe that he, he has to take some actions against the Islamophobia, which is very important today in the French society, is a huge cancer and disease and he has taken uh, a lot of place in our society. Today, uh, uh, there is a lot of Islamophobia in our society, in French media, in many uh, uh, areas, and in many uh, uh, topics we talk about today, every day, about Muslim, about the hijab. When you open your TV, you can see today uh, in the TV every time that Muslims have been targeting and, uh, and marginalizing by uh, some uh, commentator and racist and mm. Islamophobe. So uh, okay. the government has to give the example against the Islamophobia. The OIC, the, organi the organization yeah, of Islamic operation, yeah. uh, 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 
uh, has taken oh, an alarm. I, I, I wanted to I wanted to ask you a follow up question to that, if I may, because uh, if you can keep answers brief, then we'll get through. I think lots okay. of questions. Because I've got loads of questions. I could spend all night here talking Sorry, to you, yeah. Hamid. Uh, really fascinating <laughs> conversation. <laughs> Uh, President Macron's recent ultimatum to French imams was to ask them to sign a chart of Republican values. What is this and what was the reaction from those imams? Uh, obviously, the, the most majority of imams refused to sign this uh, charter, the Republican of the values. I mean, if you are French Muslim, you don't need to sign a charter. Why he didn't ask the Christian or the Jewish people? So it is clearly, clearly... Uh, kind of domestication against the French Muslim and discrimination, religious discrimination, according to the uh, uh, the, 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 the Charter of Human Rights uh, 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 14 article. So I believe an article 3 and 2 and 4. So it is a clearly discrimination based on what? On religious. So I believe it was a mistake by the French president and that's why many imams, French imams, refused to sign this uh, charter and it was again, uh, another defeat for the French president. Uh, I believe today that the majority of the French Muslims respect the law, respect everything in France, they are in the, their own country, and the French uh, uh, president has mm. to consider okay. the French Muslim and to work with them. They are a partner and not enemy. Yeah, and because the government ministers are arguing for a French secularized Islam, what what even where do you even begin with that what you listen to me uh, secularism uh, there is a many definition even the, the 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 minister talk about that he doesn't even know what is the history what comes secularism is uh, for everybody secularism is the opposite he he does protect your religion and your faith he's not against but unfortunately some uh, uh, politician for an electoral purpose uh, and they wanted to go uh, uh, to run for the presidency they unfortunately use and utilize the secularism against a few communities and particularly the Muslim community. Yeah. Today in but, France, but, but do, you, do you accept that there is a... Than, do, you, do, you, do you accept? Do you accept? And it's a huge stake. Okay. Do Nobody you, accept that. Nobody do, do accept you, that. Let me ask you the question. Do you accept that there is a threat from terrorism in which dozens of French people have been killed and the government's solemn duty is to do something to protect its citizens? Yeah, but if the French uh, government want to protect their citizens, don't forget that when there was a, 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 a terrorism attack, there there were a lot of French Muslims who they have been killed. Do not forget that. And the majority today, who who is uh, uh, who is the first the first casualties in the world are the Muslim, according to the statistic, and you know that as a commentator. So nineteen percent of the, ca the the casualties in the world against terrorism, I'm Muslim. So yeah. if there is... I, I just if, smile, I just smile because... Uh, is, the, is the Muslim world who has to... I just smile because a, usually a commentator can spot a... a yeah. Usually a commentator can spot a commentator from a mile away. That's why I'm smiling, <laughs> uh, not because of the severity of the conversation we were having. Look, we've reached the end of the programme. I just got one final question. I, I promise yeah. to get you back if you're up, uh, up for coming back uh, as a guest on future... Uh, and of course, I will come to London to see you. Yeah, inshallah, most welcome. Inshallah, uh, yeah. uh, Marie Le Pen uh, is rising in the polls. Uh, I've got about 30 seconds. Uh, what do you think is going to happen in the election next year, in the presidential election? Will Macron win again? Listen, Ma Marie Le Pen can win the election, of course. The, the COVID-19 uh, has considerably uh, increased his, uh, her popularity in, the, in France. Many factors, which is very complicated here to to develop because we don't have enough time. Unfortunately, you know, as a commentator, we speak a lot, as you said previously. So I think I believe that- I definitely that don't speak as much as you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that they have a chance to, to win. And yeah. I know her as well. Sometimes she uh, asks me to mm. give her some recommendation, particularly about the hijab. I try to explain her that hijab is not something with a submission okay. to women, um, but is liberties for women who want to thank wear it as a free woman. Thank we you. are not against and we will not impose a hijab. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so That's much that. for coming on the program. Uh, I really enjoyed that conversation. I, I really love to get you back and we can have a, a more Allah. detailed conversation. Uh, please, please keep safe, Hamid Creep there, joining yeah. us uh, live from Paris uh, in France, uh, reflecting on life for French Muslims, but more importantly, looking at the issues that will 
face the French electorate as it goes to the presidential elections next year. 2022 is when President Macron, who said he's standing for re-election, Marie Le Pen, uh, a rerun of the two in the 2017. Now, next week, we're going to be heading to London. And the Green Party in the local elections has made massive progress. And we'll be talking to the Assembly member, Zach Polanski, about the Green Party successes in the election. And what now? As you see in Germany, the Greens are up. Um, and we'll also have to Manchester to talk to Nisar Ali about male sexual abuse. And we'll also be talking to Asa Winstanley, the broadcaster and uh, writer about what was happening in Gaza. That is the end of the show. It's still 1-1. One, one. It's time for extra time. So that means I can quickly go off and watch the last 30 minutes of the football. Please keep safe. Thank you, the team behind the scenes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.